beautiful les lesson. Our Father in heaven, how we pray that um, wheresoever we have dishonored you, we ask that you forgive us. And as we learn of these truths, we pray that we may have hearts that are receptive to understand the truth and and to be willing to live by the truth. And we pray that we you may enlighten our understanding by your Holy Spirit, Father, and whatsoever we shall learn. May we share with those that have not had the opportunity to learn with us. We pray that you be with the presenter, guide her by your Holy Spirit, guide each and every one of us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much, Sister Mwangala. And at this point in time, we shall have a special song by Sister Memory. Miriam, sorry, Miriam, as we wait for the presenter to join us shortly. Sister Miriam, please confirm if you are in the I guess Sister Miriam is not with us yet. Let us be patient and wait for a few minutes for the presenter to join us. Sorry, what's the title of the presentation again? It is the Public Campus Ministries Seminar on Modesty. Thank you. You are most welcome. Amongst our participants, as we wait for memory to Miriam to come, is there anyone who has a special song to offer to us? We have. Oh, please go ahead and give us the song. Okay, we are saying uh, the song from Fumbo our favorite song. Mm. 
That was a wonderful song. I'm sure everyone is blessed by it. Um, the presenter is facing some challenges joining us, but she'll be with us in a bit. We will be discussing the topic of modesty as you all know, and she'll be addressing some of the issues such as personal decoration and how naked is naked, what does feminism have to do with the way I dress? But modesty also caters for the brothers. It is not solely for the sisters alone, so we all have something to take out of it. Let us be open-minded and let us let Christ speak to us. Yes, we, we shouldn't be closed up and let us use scripture to consolidate whatever we will learn today. Is there anyone else who would like to offer a song as we wait? Um, kindly repeat the last point. What was the last point? <laughs> Sorry, my I lecture hate, always- I hate it. Oh, yeah, please, kind of. I would saying something like, uh, as we wait, something like that. Oh, I was saying that, um, is there anyone else who would like to offer a song as we wait for her? She will join us shortly. I think she's facing some challenges with the network or connectivity. Uh, can the group again for another one? 
Oh, most definitely, if they are willing to. Okay, um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you're audible. Thank you. I'm going to sing a hymn. A hymn is 166. Rock of Ages, 166, local. Rock of Ages, clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the river side that flowed be of sin the double cube. Save me from its cute and power, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demand. Could my zeal no respite, no? Could my tears forever fall? Oh, for sin could not atone. Thou myself and thou alone, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Far I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, oh, I die. Wow, I draw this flattened breath. When my eyes shall close in death. When I saw to world unknown, see the on thy judgment throne, local virgins cleared for me. Let me hide myself in thee, local virgins cleared for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Amen. Thank you very much for that wonderful song. Um, is there anyone else who would like to give a special song? I saw a hand. Brother Henry, would you like to sing? I can also give a special song if you don't mind. We don't mind. Thank you so much for not minding. Saved by the bell, the presenter is in actually. So I think we will uh, have the meeting. So. Good morning. Good morning, Sister Grace. Hello? Are you waiting for me, Sister Grace? Good evening. Yeah, it's evening. Oh, it's evening. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, should I begin? now or i'm waiting for i was waiting for sister grace to say something um good evening sister gwen hi sister grace good evening actually my name is judith i am the moderator for your meeting oh thank you judy thank you so much 
You're welcome. We already had the opening prayer and opening song, so we were just waiting for you to start. Okay. Do you mind if I have another prayer? <laughs> Quick one. Is that okay? That would be amazing. That's uh, fine. And you can see me and you can hear me, correct? Correct. Okay, very good. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for all that you have done for me this morning. The enemy has put up almost a thousand barriers and you've knocked them all down. And thank you for my help here that is sitting beside me to make sure that everything goes well. Lord, you know that we are preparing for your coming. And our preparation involves everything that we do in this life, what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, where we go. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be heard through the words that I speak. And may everyone on this call be blessed abundantly in the precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray, amen. 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 So, yes, I've had a lot of barriers this morning, but the Lord has knocked them all down and I'm here by his grace. We're going to cover three areas. Number one is ornaments, pers personal decoration and more. And we're also going to cover how naked is naked. And what does the feminist movement have to do with what I wear. First, I would like to give you a brief testimony of uh, who I am, where I come from, how I got here, etc. Uh, my name is Gwen Shorter. I am the daughter of a Sunday preacher. My father is passed away, but I was raised in a Sunday keeping home. And I repeated the fourth commandment every Sunday, believing that it was my that it was the Sabbath day. I also had never heard of a Seventh Day Adventist. I had graduated from college in the Midwest and then received a scholarship to New York University uh, in the village of New York City to work on my master's degree. And when I went there, I found uh, I was also a singer, a rhythm and blues singer. And so I would go to the nightclubs to uh, sing to make extra money. One time I was going to a nightclub with an advertisement I had got from a piece of paper, from a paper. And what happened was, I saw out of the corner of my eye, uh, a young man coming down the street walking in a brown leather coat. And it turns out his name was Rick Shorter. And he had grown up a Seventh-day Adventist and he was running away from the truth. And I was trying to find some kind of truth in this world, something that made sense. Did you know the Seventh-day Adventist message makes sense to rational people and it has a certain ring of truth? And guess what? Truth seekers hear that truth and they want to absorb, embrace all of it. Not part of it, but all of it. So while I was in New York City, I would make my way to the Apollo Theater and sing. I was a professional singer, recording artist, et cetera, professional model, and also working on my, my master's degree, majoring in acting. So uh, to sum it up, I was studying to be a show business person. And in the middle of that, the Lord arrest my attention with um, a program on TV called It Is Written with George Vanderman. And he offered a book free, Steps to Christ. 
And I said, oh, I want that book. So I took the number down, called in, and they sent me the book, but it was too deep. It was by Ellen White, Steps to Christ. So I never read it. But when the evangelist came to town, uh, they sent invitations to everyone who had called and ever called in requesting a book. I was on that list. So the meetings were almost over. I kept telling Rick, he, he was going to the Sunday church in Harlem with me and he never mentioned Seventh-day Adventist. And so uh, I said, could you please take me by this church because I just wanna say thank you to these people. I'm not gonna stay. I just wanna say thank you for sending me the book and all these tickets. I never got tickets to an evangelistic meeting. So I went there. It was only 10 days left in the meetings. And Sister Carol Halverson was standing at the door. She said, if you come every night, you'll get your own free Bible. I said, what? Well, I'm coming every night. I'm a pastor's kid and I never had my own Bible. So I said, I know my way here. If I have to walk, I'm going. <laughs> so I went to every meeting not knowing what to expect. It was only the last 10 days. But as we were sitting in the meeting, they only had three more days left. Rick Shorter and I came to those seven meetings. He gave another call. This call was for anyone who wanted to accept Jesus Christ into their life. The sermon was so compelling. I remember that I will never forget the words that he said. He said, to linger is to be lost. And I didn't open up my eyes until I said, wait a minute. I opened up my eyes and the seat was empty beside me and Rick was, was sitting beside me. But when I opened my eyes and looked up front, he was standing there with his head down all by himself. And I just said, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, ma'am. Okay. I said, he's not leaving me behind. So I gave my heart to the Lord and I prayed. And I said, Lord, you know what's best. I don't know where my life is leading but I'm trusting you. Long story short, we were baptized a few days later. And the main thing I didn't want to give up was my jewelry. And that's our first subject. So I'm going to read to you in our jewelry book. This is a jewelry book. My husband said, why are you writing that jewelry book? And I said, because the Seventh-day Adventist ladies don't know why they don't wear jewelry. Every time I ask them, they just say the church said it or uh, they say they don't know. And so I wrote this book, Jewelry, Ornaments, Personal Decoration and War, The Spiritualism Connection. So I want to read my testimony to you. So you can, by the way, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, my dad said to me, your branch cut off family tree. And I just said to myself, that's all right. I got family all over the world now. And sure enough, I have people that love God and love the truth that I was learning. So I want to read this testimony. I wrote it probably 30 years ago or 35, I don't know. And it's entitled, so you want to dress up or down, an ex-model's testimony. The streets of New York City with its hustle, bustle, bright lights, and millions of people was the place to be. How exciting, I would think to myself as I hurried from one appointment to another, swinging my portfolio. You can look, but you can't touch, was my motto. As a motto in the fashion capital of the world, dressing up or down was highly competitive. In those days, I wore micro mini skirts, pants, form fitting sweaters, low cut shorts, and anything else I wanted. 
I knew the power of a fashionable and well-dressed woman. And I wanted to use that power to help me climb the show business ladder. Models set the standard for what most women call beauty on TV, in magazines, newspaper shows, and et cetera. They are used to set the styles. Anyone can put on clothes, but models must put it all together to impress, attract, and alarm the senses. They must sell clothes and themselves. And there I was right in the middle of it all. And I loved my shoes. Every time I bought a new dress, I had to buy a new pair of shoes. My heart would actually speed up with excitement from just looking at a pair of fancy shoes. I just knew they were made for me, just my style. I would deny myself food if necessary to buy what I wanted to dress up or down. My manicure and pedicure was always done to perfection. In order to keep up with my quote beauty, I had jars, bottles, tubes of all sorts of concoctions between facial masks, moisturizer, toners, foundation, eyeshadow, pencil liner and brush, lipstick and lip gloss, body powder, face powder, perfume, polish for nails, polish remover, files, expensive hairdos, false eyelashes, leg shaving, paraphernalia, et cetera, et cetera. I spend hundreds of dollars just to keep myself, quote, together. Makeup was extreme, an extremely important factor in my so-called beauty. I really love the way makeup made me look. Did I do something wrong? Okay. I was, it was supposed to make me feel secure and good about myself, but it made my feeling of insecurity worse. Do you think I would be caught without it? No way. I never even took off my makeup at night. I didn't want to face the naked truth of what I really looked like without it. I would wash my face in the morning and quickly re reapply my face. How pitiful. I wasted so much time and money trying to be beautiful on the outside. The girly glamour magazines had captured and distorted my view of, of a virtuous woman, beauty and femininity. Dressing up was not complete without my jewelry. Those precious little trinkets and ornaments of gold and silver made any outfit look exquisite. My jewelry box overflowed with all kinds of earrings, necklaces, bracelets, brooches, and rings. Sorry, ma'am, we can't get Yes. Yes. Are you saying something to me? Yes. Someone was saying they could not hear you. They could not hear me. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. Okay, let me try to speak a little louder, okay? Okay. You, do you want me to continue now? Yes, you can continue, ma'am. I think we can get you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we can you. get you and continue. Okay. My jewelry box overflowed with all kinds of earrings, necklaces, bracelets, brooches, and rings. To be honest, I worship jewelry and I felt naked without it. And besides, it made me look good whether I dressed up or down. Always in the mirror, checking this and checking that. Everything had to be just perfect. My everyday ritual of pampering and primpering Primping took about two hours before I was ready to face the public. When I emerged to meet the public eye, I, I would get those whistles, cat calls, and turnaround looks from men. I would appear not to hear or even see them. My motto was, look, but don't touch. You know, it never once occurred to me that I might be tempting and teasing a man. Once at a dance, a perfect stranger touched me inappropriately. I was so angry, I couldn't figure out why this man wouldn't 
would not just look, but touch. And the first argument that I had with my husband, Rick, before we were married was over the mini skirts and the low cuts that I wore. I flatly told him if he didn't like it, find someone else. And I meant it. I had no intention of changing and he never brought up that subject again. Nobody was changing me. And besides, change to what? I only knew one way, my way of dressing up or down. That whatever the style was. Then I met Jesus. This was like a miracle. Everything I ever wanted in life, love, acceptance, security, and peace of mind, I found in Jesus. I, didn't, I did not know I could have a personal experience with Jesus, even though my father was a pastor. I didn't know that he loved me so much as if I were the only one in the world. I didn't know that Jesus was soon coming back to this earth. I'd never heard that before in my life. When I learned this, no one had to tell me, take off your makeup, your jewelry, and your immodest clothing. When I looked in the mirror after I surrendered my life to Jesus, I didn't look the same. What I thought was so beautiful looked ugly and phony and pretentious and proud. No one had to tell me jewelry was inappropriate for a humble follower of Jesus. When I read those Bible texts on jewelry, I began shedding all my little precious idols from head to toe. What a relief, nothing between my savior and me. No one had to tell me to get rid of my mini skirts and pants and low cuts. One day I packed them all up and took them to the local thrift shop. Why? Because I knew that Jesus would not like them. And I wanted to do everything to please the one who saved me from death and self-destruction. I had to ask the Lord to forgive me because I knew I had caused many a man to sin in his heart because of the way I dressed. And no more nakedness for me in the name of water and sun and fun that colored underwear that I used to wear to the beach all of a sudden became strange apparel. No longer could I hide behind the excuse of getting recreation. Now I know God made men with a completely different sexual nature than that of a woman. Unconverted man's sexual nature is so sensitive, sensitive that it can be ignited into a fire by just the sight of a half-dressed or seductively dressed female. Provocative clothing, such as the peekaboo dress, the shorts, the short slit or tight skirt, the low-cut blouse, stocking legs, form-fitting sweaters, pants, or jeans, all distract the, the minds of most men to unholy thoughts. The indulgent apparel could mean the loss of eternal life, not to just one man, but a whole host of them. Before I was dressing to bring attention to myself. Now I only wanted to hide behind Jesus. Before I wasted hundreds of dollars and hours of precious probationary time trying to make myself beautiful by the world standard. Now I spend those hours in the study of God's word and in prayer. I realize that beauty is a Christ-like character. Before I loved dressing up or down or showing off the clothes from my already overflowing closet. Before I kept pace with the ever-changing fashions, now I measure my wardrobe by God's word. Before I was insecure, I wouldn't let anyone see me without my makeup. Now I am plain, placid, and pleased to be a child of the King. Now I feel secure because I know Jesus loves me just the way I am. And he loves you too, just the way you are. And this gives me courage to share this message of truth to all who will listen. With my burdens lifted and my idols torn down, 
what peace, sweet peace I enjoy. That was over, and I put here 25 years ago. That's when I wrote it, but actually it's over 50 years now. Can you believe that? I still like to dress up, but only in Christ's beautiful robe of righteousness and down with everything that displeases him. Your friend, Gwen. So that's my testimony. I apologize for the tears because the tears flow because I don't really recognize myself. God has made such changes in me and I'm so grateful that I could not hold the tears back no more than you could hold back Niagara Falls. I want to begin our study of modesty with this text. This statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, Christ Object Lessons, page 94. Before I forget, if you go to my website, homewardpublishingministries.com, and go to audio of Ellen G. White, Ellen G. White's books, you can find every book that Ellen White wrote, and you can find it in audio. So there's no more excuse saying, oh, I don't have the Spirit of Prophecy books. Just go to my website, homewardpublishingministries.com, and you can read every book that Ellen White wrote. And you can actually follow along with me. And again, this is Christ Object Lessons, page 97. Our first work is with the heart. As the leaven, when mingled with the meal, works from within outward, so it is by the renewing of the heart that the grace of God works to transform the life. No mere external change is sufficient to bring us into harmony with God. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit, and they hope in this way to become Christians. But they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. And so, brothers and sisters, to take off your jewelry, and this is an introductory remark, just so we have it straight from the beginning. To put on a long skirt, to cover your limbs, whatever you want to do for modesty is not making you a Christian. Making you a Christian or taking off your makeup, making you a Christian is to give your heart fully to the Lord Jesus Christ and be obedient to all of his requirements. And that is included in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now I want to begin here, uh, first of all, by this book of, is full of texts and I'm gonna go through it quickly because of the time, because I can see the time is escaping from us. And this is the first chapter, Bible answers to your questions on jewelry, ornaments, personal decoration, and more. How does the Bible refer to jewelry? Because you will not find the word jewelry in the Bible. It refers to jewelry in the word ornaments. Ornaments, like you decorate a tree or you decorate a house. Ornaments, something you just put on. And so, where do we find those texts in Judges, Jeremiah, Exodus, 2 Samuel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah? Now, how does the Bible define, how does the dictionary define ornaments and jewelry? Something that adorns or decorates, that which embellishes, is added to another thing, rendering it more beautiful to the eye. And jewelry, such as bracelets, rings, precious metals, gems, artificial gems, ornaments, uh, to adorn with jewels. Now, I had some pictures here that I wanted to show you. 
of jewelry, the evolution of jewelry in pictures. And it started out as little beads sewn together, uh, all kinds of uh, very rudimentary things. And I want to show you this. <laughs> oh, maybe you can. Can you see that? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. And then it turned into um, ornaments of gold and silver, etc. And actually, in Isaiah three, all of these things are mentioned. Mentioned uh, nose jewels, and you probably thought that was uh, modern day, but nose rings have been around for a long time. And so I want to show you a few pictures. This is a picture of a woman from Central Africa ador adorned with amulets. Amulets were little trinkets that uh, were to protect the person from disease or from disaster or from evil. And these nose piercings and necklaces and bracelets were worn in Central Africa. So this is a lady from that portion of the world, you may know more about this than I did, and jewelry was worn for magical purposes and for status and wealth. So this is the lady from Central Africa. Now my second picture is a Yemen bride adorned with jewelry. Isn't she, I mean, I don't know if she has clothes on, but she certainly has a lot of jewelry on. <laughs> Can you see her? Okay. And then I have this other picture. This one you'll recognize maybe Queen, of, Queen Elizabeth I of England showing off her jewels. This is her. And I have down in the uh, underneath her picture, a statement from Testimonies 1, page 134, which says, while you make yourselves appear like the world and as beautiful as you can, remember the same body may in a few days be food for worms. And while you adorn it to your taste to please the eye, you are dying spiritually. Okay, so that is my pictures. Now, um, what kind of ornaments and jewelry and adornment and personal decorations are mentioned in the Bible? Would you believe earrings, golden earrings, chains, bracelets, rings, jewels of gold and silver, nose jewels, ornaments, perils? Tablets, collars, crisping pins. What are collars, pendants, or brooches? Tablets refer to necklaces. And we put these things on because we think they make us look more beautiful because we're looking at the world. Did you know the wearing of jewelry came from the fact that the women or the daughters of Zion had a glow to their face? They didn't have any makeup on. That was the beauty and the love of Jesus shining out. And the worldly women did not have it. And so they wanted to have a glow to their, to their face as well. So they started putting on makeup and then it was war paint. And now it's cover up, cover up everything you don't want anybody to see. Okay, uh, crisping pins, that's richly ornamented purses changeable suits of apparel, costly array, glasses, fine linens, hoods and veils and lingerie and beautiful dresses and veils, plaited hair, well-set hair, facial paint, eye paint, sweet smelling perfume. The Lord said he's gonna turn that into stink in Isaiah 3, 24. Marks or cuttings in your flesh or tattoos or piercing. These all came from an effort of man to make himself beautiful minus the glory of God. Now, uh, you can find those in the Bible, but 
I'm going to skip over some of this. What other time? Do you have a question? I do. Hello, colleagues, can you please mute? Okay, someone came off. Okay. What other kinds of ornaments or jewelry and adornment or personal decoration evolved over the years but are not mentioned in the Bible? The cuff link, the clip, the tie tack, barrettes, decorative combs, hair ornaments or jewels, decorate the decorative buckle, body piercings of the tongue, the navel, the nose, and the lip, the dinner or cocktail ring, which is a conversational piece, the engagement ring, the wedding band, the man's ring, toll rings, watches that are more jewelry than timekeepers, medallions, hat ornaments, head ornaments, like diadems, tiaras, frontlets, circlets, and so forth. Brooches of all kinds, collar pins, handles of walking canes or sticks, even jewelry boxes and snuff boxes, costume jewelry, scarves, and hats. Okay, so how does the Bible refer to jewelry? Does God like it? Well, the Bible calls it, first of all, strange gods. Genesis 35, two to four, says then jacob said to his household and to all that would that were with him put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and they gave unto jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears they're also called strange vanities in jeremiah 4 30 jeremiah 8 19 they're called uh strange vanities Isaiah 3.18, they're called tinkling ornaments. Isaiah 4.4, 4, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So God calls jewelry, ornaments, personal decoration, filth. Also the same in Ezekiel 16, 36 and 39, thus saith the Lord, because thy filthiness was poured out, etc. And they are called idols in Psalm 115, 4. They're idols of silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Psalm 135, 15, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold and the works of men's hands. And in Colossians and and Samuel. Jewelry is also, and ornaments are also called a detestable thing in Ezekiel 7, 19 and 20. And they're called whoredoms in Ezekiel 16, 15 and 17. And Ezekiel 23, 19. And in Ezekiel 16, 17 to 18, they are referred to as wickedness. Thou hast taken Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and silver, which I have given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them, and tookest thou thy broidered garments to cover them, and thou hast set mine oil and my incense before them. So what is the Lord saying here? And it came to pass, after all thy wickedness, Ezekiel 16, 23, woe unto thee, saith the Lord thy God. Also, these things are called abominations in Ezekiel, Deuteronomy, and Jeremiah. How does the Bible feel about abominations? You know what abominations are? A detestable thing. God hates Severely, he hates abominable things and jewelry, pers personal decoration and ornaments are in that class. How would you like to make something beautiful if you're an artist and then somebody comes along and adds something else to it and they think it's beautiful, 
but is actually an abomination. What prophets and men spoke out against the wearing of ornaments, personal decoration, jewelry. In Genesis, Exodus, in Genesis, Jacob spoke, up, spoke out against it. In Exodus, Moses, in Judges, Gideon, and Isaiah spoke against it. In Isaiah 3, and Jeremiah, again, Jeremiah 4.30, Ezekiel 23.40, Hosea spoke against these things, Zephaniah, Paul, and James. So I just want to read one more thing, and then we're going to go to how naked is naked. Who wore the ornaments, jewelry, adornment, and personal decoration in the body, in the Bible? This was very eye-opening to me. Because as I began to study the subject and follow it through the concordances, only the heathen nations wore jewelry. God's people never wore jewelry unless they had uh, fallen into apostasy. So today, to see a woman wearing jewelry, calling herself a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, is to say to everybody that sees her, I have apostatized. That's what you're saying when you put on the ornaments, the jewelry, and the makeup, the personal decoration or war paint. Who wore ornaments and jewelry and adornment and personal decoration in the Bible? And it says, Exodus 12, 35, and the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold. So the Egyptians wore jewelry. Genesis, uh, it says that the Pharaohs wore jewelry. And Ezekiel, it says the Egyptians wore jewelry. And it shall be the basis of kingdoms, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them that they shall no more rule over the nations. And it's true. We don't hear anything about Egypt anymore, hardly. The Midianites, also uh, that's in Numbers and Judges and plenty of texts in Judges. You'll have to use an accordant, a concordance to find all the texts. And the Ishmaelites, which were not, uh, they were not God's people, wore jewelry. The, the Persians and the Medes wore jewelry. The Babylonians, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the children of Mount Seir. The Philistines wore jewelry. The Zidonians wore jewelry. Do you know who was a famous Zidonian? Jezebel, and so forth and so on. So you, and guess what? Apostate Israel wore jewelry and even Satan himself in Ezekiel 28, 13, 14, and 17. So jewelry is no problem. The, the, you know, we're going to walk on gold, streets of gold in the new earth. But in our sinful condition, it causes us to think that we're something that we're not. So we're not to put it on this beautiful creation that God has made. I hope that answers some questions for you when it comes to jewelry, ornaments, and personal decoration. And so now we'd like to prayerfully move to how naked is naked. You know, nakedness, when someone mentions nakedness, it can be relative. In other words, when Peter was naked in the Bible, he had his clothes off and he was coming to the Lord. If you really study that passage of scripture, you'll find out he really wasn't what we call butt naked, but he had on his underclothes, but that was still referred to as naked. And you will realize when you study the anatomy and physiology of the Bible that the body, the human frame does not like coldness. We are creatures of warmth. And so the health message underneath 
is the dress message. And the three major principles of the dress message is, first of all, not to adorn ourselves with jewelry, ornaments, or personal decoration. Secondly, to cover the body. Now, how should you cover the body? I have to get my Bible, please, in there. <laughs> Thank you. How should you cover the, vibe, the, vibe, the body? Well, we find the story in Genesis that Adam and Eve uh, were naked after they sinned. And when they heard the voice, it's in that back, other back. And when they discovered they were naked, they tried, excuse me, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. But God said, no, 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 that's not enough. You need to really cover yourself. And so uh, God is not um, asking us to do anything that he has not done himself. And so we find that in the book of Revelation, starting with chapter one, verse 13, it says, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment. How far was it down? Down to the foot and gird about the pipes with a golden girdle. I love this text. And if you will follow the word nakedness throughout the Bible, you will realize that the woman was supposed to experience shame when she was not fully covered, but that is not even possible anymore, not even among our believers. Nakedness can be exposed of the legs, of the arms, of other parts of the body, and guess what? The woman feels no shame, but Jesus had on a garment down to the foot. So, what is the principle here? And notice I said principle because we are talking about principles that were established in the Garden of Eden. The principle is complete covering. Notice that Adam and Eve had on aprons and God clothed them and made, he was the first tailor. He made for them coats as garments. Coats meaning something with sleeves, something that came all the way down. Now, I want you to see this picture here. This is a picture of the first bathing suits in 18, 1864. That does not look like a bathing suit. Before I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I used to wear bikinis. And at the beach and I didn't feel any shame either. But once I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I couldn't do that anymore. In fact, the church had a swimming, uh, what they, it was a swimming party at the YMCA in New York City. And I said, how can those ladies get in that water and undress themselves completely? I couldn't do it in the name of the church or anybody's name because I had become and it wasn't because I had read anything. It was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And he will speak to you if you want the truth. If you don't want it, he won't speak to you. Okay, so it says here, Satan is constantly devising some new style of dress that will prove an injury to physical and moral health. Do you think the bathing suits have changed? Now, this is a picture of the bathing suit in 1871. It looks like a dress. But that was an undergarment, a bathing suit. And then I have just a few more. Okay, this was the one in 1881 and the other one on the opposite page is 1892. Notice that they begin to uncover the arms first. This was a bold uh, stand for the women of that day, because they were always seen perfectly covered, legs, arms, everything. And then in 1892, almost the turn of the century, they even covered the bottom part of their legs. Now it's over with, it's over with. 
Satan has led God's people and the whole world with the help of Hollywood because Hollywood and models set the style for the whole world. And most of it is centered in Paris, in Paris and in New York City, where I was. And so I had no idea what I was supposed to change to at first, but I remember the day that I got baptized. And this is where my dress reform journey started. It was a Caucasian church. Well, most of the churches in uh, New York City at that time in the 70s were, it was in 1970. I had just gotten baptized maybe a month or so. And there was this little Caucasian girl that was getting baptized. Uh, I say little because uh, it's little to me now, but she wasn't little. She was, oh, I would estimate probably 20, 24. And she had long hair down her back and her arms were fully covered and her dress came almost to the floor, but it was like a little lower than mid thigh. And I was sitting in the pew in the Manhattan Seventh-day Adventist Church where I had just been baptized with a straight skirt on. And ladies, you know what I mean. A straight skirt comes down to almost the knee when you're standing up, but when you sit down, what happens? It was almost mid thigh. And here I am pulling, 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 trying to get some material, you know, to cover my thighs because there were men sitting on the row and I was embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I guess I'm a <laughs> little crybaby. <laughs> I started crying. I said, Lord, because the Lord spoke to my mind and says, you're naked. And I said, you're right. I am naked. And I feel like it looking at this girl that's getting baptized. I feel like I'm naked. And I, I cried so much. I couldn't, I couldn't cry sitting there quietly. So I went down after the baptism. I went down into the basement. And I sat on the basement steps and I just cried. And I said, Lord, from this day on, I'm going to cover my body. And I don't know what I'm going to cover it with. I don't know how I'm going to cover it, but I'm going to cover my body because I realize I'm naked. I only had one long skirt at the time as a quote, uniform in our restaurant in New York City. Why did we choose that? Because we just wanted um, uniformity among the waitresses in our restaurant in New York City called The Beautiful Way, a strict vegetarian restaurant in 1971. And so that began my journey with dress reform, which has been the most beautiful revelation to me of God's goodness, his mercy, and his love. There is so much to understand in the dress message that makes you want to, uh, makes me want to just thank the Lord and praise him every day. I cannot imagine being a half-baked Christian or a compromising Christian dressing half naked. And to be naked is to have any portion of your body re uh, reveal to someone who is not your husband. Ladies, sisters in Christ, your body belongs to your husband after you get married, not before. Not for him to lust at before. And so with that, we're going to move right into the next portion, which is, and I didn't say anything about the engagement ring or the wedding ring, but these things all come from paganism. It came from paganism, the jewelry, the ornaments, the rings, from paganism to the Roman Catholic Church, from the Roman Catholic Church to the evangelical churches, 
from the evangelical churches to the Seventh-day Adventist church. So we are copying the world when we put these things on our bodies or when we half clothe our body. Now, I have to save some time for, how much more time do I have, Sister Judy? Our meeting is supposed to end at 21 hours. Okay. Okay, so I will cover this and then I will save a, a, a little time for, I will cover this briefly, save a little time for uh, questions and answers. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is to read in the Bible, the text Deuteronomy 22.5. This is a powerful text. When I was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I started reading through the Bible and I came to this text. And lo and behold, for the first time in my life, because I was a preacher's kid, back then we didn't wear pants anywhere, not to the store, we didn't wear them anywhere. And so, uh, I actually went to a university in the Midwest in the 60s, and there was a sister from St. Louis. She came back from the holiday season. Uh, she came back with some pants on. I remember her name. Her name was Sandra. Sandra knew that we didn't wear pants pants on campus, but she thought she'd make a rebellious, bold move and put on pants and come back. And guess what? They sent her right back home. And I never forgot that. So uh, those of you who are much younger, you know, uh, you don't probably know how it was in this country. I'm not sure, although I know that in some parts of Africa, there was the same kind of modesty going on there as was going on here. So let's look at my, uh, Deuteronomy 22, 5, which says, um, let's see, Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so, are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. And when I read that, it stopped me in, that, in my tracks. I couldn't read any further because I had just bought for the first time in 1970, three pair of pants. I didn't own a pair before then. And the Lord said to my mind, take those pants back to the store because I hadn't even put them on. You know what I said? Did I argue with the Lord? You think I argued with the Lord? Lord, why should I take these pants back? These pants are going to keep me warm in New York. No, I didn't say that. I said, yes, Lord. And I took them back and got my money back. Well, later on, I read this statement when I began to read the spirit of prophecy. And by the way, that was my stand against cross-dressing unisex, whatever you want to call it, but I never put on another pair of pants, I put on a pair of pants at all after the Lord told me to take them back to the, um, take them back to the store. But here's what I want to share with you because I read this in the spirit of prophecy in first testimony 457. And I'm quoting those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the, remember this, so-called dress reform might as well sever all connections with the third angel's message. The spirit which attends the one cannot be in harmony with the other. The scriptures are plain upon the relations and rights of men. Spiritualists have to quite an extent adopted this singular mode of dress. Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the restoration of the gifts are often branded as spiritualists or cults. Let them adopt this costume and their influence is dead. 
the people would place them on a level with spiritualists and refuse to listen to them. So in a nutshell, Ellen White is saying, if you put on the reform dress, the so-called reform dress, remember it's so-called, you might as well sever or separate from the Seventh-day Adventist church, the three angels message, because the spiritualists are doing it. Who are the spiritualists? Those who claim Christ, but they are really spiritualists. And she said, adopt this costume and your influence is dead. Now, does, does anybody know what the American costume looked like? Have you ever seen pictures of it? Well, I have it in this book, Thy Nakedness, Lord, What Shall I Wear? I have several of them. And I also have it in this book, which is a little small book. I think it's like $5, $5, but it's just a few pages. It's not a lot of pages. It's less than 50 pages, uh, I think. Yes, almost. And I put this picture here, three pictures of the so-called dress reform. Now, the first one is Dr. Miss Austin or uh, Dr. York. And she says, they dress very much like men and she says, we shall never imitate them. Okay, so this is the so-called dress reform. Where my finger is, is what she's re referring to the picture. She says, it's a dress over a pair of pants. She says, we will never Im imitate Dr. Austin or Dr. York because they dress very much like men. Now that was when they had on a skirt that came below the knees and pants showing just on the lower part. But then you see in the second picture, Dr. Mary Walker started out wearing the regular American costume, but became increasingly masculine in her attire. And then at the very last, this is the same lady, she's cut her hair, she has a tie on, she was arrested several times for impersonating a man. This is in Ellen White's day. She had taken fully to wearing men's clothes from the top hat, the wing collar, the bow tie, and the pants and shoes. So you see that? That is the so-called dress reform. I'm so sorry we don't have all the pictures to do this. I had planned to send them to Grace beforehand. But as I said, the enemy kept putting barriers in my way so that I could not get these pictures to you. But you see them anyway. Okay, so now here's a picture of a family, SDA family on a Sabbath afternoon walk. And this walk, um, it says underneath, first we abhor, then we ignore, then we tolerate, then we participate. This picture by permission is an example of the so-called dress reform without the dress over it. It's open sin because we see it. It's immodest and abomination to the Lord. The woman has confiscated the man's apparel a bifurcated divided garment, the spiritualist known uniform and a symbol of their power. Now I'm gonna end there because I want to uh, end on time, but I want to tell you, this is the picture here. This is one family. The men and the women are dressed in androgyny clothing or garments. What's androgyny? Androgyny is a mixture of male and female characteristics. And so um, this is what God says is an abomination to him. There is more that we could cover on this subject, but I'm going to try to now answer some of the questions that were emailed to me earlier today and see if um, we can come to some conclusions here quickly. Okay, the first question 
that was emailed to me. Uh, oh, I'm just kidding. Sister Grace said she found some pictures on the website that she can uh, give me. And of course, Sister Grace can do that. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, I don't, I couldn't have made it. I want to thank my sister, Jennifer. Jennifer, say hi to them. <laughs> She's the head elder's wife here at the Newport Church in Washington. Without her, I couldn't have, have done this uh, presentation because I'm not techie, but she is. Okay, let's go with one question. Uh, number one, is it wrong to braid hair that is not harmful or exaggerated? just to look presentable and keep it put. Keeping our hair natural is beautiful, but sometimes with the busy school schedule, it becomes difficult to maintain and we may be looking untidy. No, it's not. But the number of braids becomes a problem. Uh, when my daughter lived in my home, I told her, you cannot do those braids, 100, 200 braids in your hair. Uh, and I will tell you why. No, I don't have time to tell you why. But this comes from the fetish priest who matted hair uh, and skirt they wore only when they went to worship their God. But the rest of the time they wore pants and the matted hair, that's where it comes from. And you all probably know more about that than I do. So if you have a few braids in your hair, it's not a problem if they're braided nicely and neatly. It's the braids that take eight, 10 hours, two days to do that makes it um, uh, a, a very bad thing because it, our hair does not have to follow those worldly styles. Is head covering a must? No, it is not. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, uh, I think the chapter is 11, after it talks about covering your hair, what else does it say? It says that your hair is your covering. But if a woman have long hair, it is glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering. So the people that promote hair covering and in this book, I have a complete chapter on hair covering. Don't read the whole chapter. <laughs> they don't read the last verse, which explains that your hair is a covering. Eve did not have a scarf or a hat on her head to talk to God when she was created. And so we are not asked to do that. Neither did Ellen White cover her head when she prayed. Okay, is using a little makeup to hide the skin blemishes that make us insecure wrong? Yes, it is. Uh, blemishes are a systemic problem. There's something that you're eating, probably not always, uh, that is causing the blemishes. So you need to do a detox. I wish I could have you at my medical missionary classes and um, show you how you could do simple detoxes. So long story short, a little wine is wrong, a little, smoking weed is wrong. A little cursing is wrong. A little stealing is wrong. You get my point. So no, I have been asked this question many times through the years and go for broke sisters. Do all that God says you and hold your head up high, even with the blemishes. Do you know that even with the blemishes, God can send a man that will love you forever and ever and ever, even though you have blemishes. So just praise the Lord that you have a face that somebody could look at. Okay, number six, if people compliment my dress, does it mean I'm drawing attention to myself? Must we dress in a way that no one compliments us at all? Well, that's kind of a two-way street because some people will compliment you no, no matter what you wear because they just want to be nice to you or they want to build up your self-worth, not self-esteem. And 
Uh, but I remember a beautiful peach colored blouse that had lots of buttons on the neck to the side and lots of button on the collar. And my husband said to me, Gwen, that it was no jewelry. That blouse draws too much attention. I said, this is my favorite blouse. He said, well, you need to pray about that. Whenever my husband said that, I did it. And I prayed about it. And guess what the Lord told me? Yes, it draws too much attention to yourself. You want the attention to pass on to Jesus. So you dress as plain and as simple as possible. If somebody's gonna look at you, let them see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ shining out. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay. Uh, I think that's the last question, unless we have a live question. We have a, a time for a few live questions. Anybody have a question they'd like to ask that has not been asked before? Brother Mike, you can go ahead and ask. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you so much, moderator and the presenter. The lesson is well being elaborated and you are following. I have uh, two questions to ask. The first one is uh, that of um, a, a job opportunity where a student maybe who has been doing accountants now graduates and then finds a job wh wh whose description includes all the wear and everything. Now I've seen that people in the bank get to wear a uh, short, a little bit of short penis case, but that's part of their dressing. So how would you go about that one? Uh, what word would you give to such uh, ladies? who don't have any choice in this aspect. The other one is that of- Okay, uh, let me a answer that one tailor. first, brother, my- All right, all right. Okay, first of all, it is better to obey God than man. If you have to compromise to get a job, that job is not for you, you're being tested. So dress according to the council and God will bless you more. Okay, second question. Because there is, an, there is a blessing in obedience. Brother Mike, go, go right ahead with your second question. All right, uh, I, th I th think it's, okay, let me just go ahead. Um, it's just about the job, let's say a tailor. A tailor, okay, who's not um, uh, maybe an Adventist and the like, but then us who like have the message. We see this tailor and want to ad uh, advise the tailor whereby you know, it gets to receive people on a daily basis, and these people comes to do adjustments of what they wear, uh, making tight clothing. How would we go about preaching to such people? By example, and only by precept if they ask you. We are not to judge and we are not to condemn, but we are to be an example. But do not compromise even among our people. We have uniforms. There's uniforms for everything, but everything is not for God's remnant people in these last days. Jesus is on his way here shortly, and we should not compromise anything. Okay, thank you, Brother Mike. The next person, Taonga. Taonga, go right ahead. Thank you so much. Oh, good evening, madam. Um, Could you speak I wanted to a little ask... slower because your accent is such that I'm really straining to understand you. <laughs> oh, I was saying good evening. Thank you. Yes, good evening. <laughs> good morning here. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you had mentioned about situations in the Bible where um, it was where it was recommended that people should not wear jewelry, where jewelry was disallowed. Then there was an occasion in the book of Genesis when one of Abraham's servants was sent to look for a wife for Isaac. And he put, he gave her jewelry like for the nose. So I wanted to ask like the significance there because it got me like confused. Are they only allowed when maybe someone is having a wedding or mm -hmm. I just want to know okay. that's on that part. I understand. Thank you so much for the question. You know, in the Bible, there are many instances where uh, the 
how can I say it? The traditions or customs of the day crossed it, crossed God's will. They were not aware of it. The light has been shining on our paths, accumulated for many, many generations. And for over, for almost 6,000 years. So when we want to understand, just because we read of a circumstance in the Bible doesn't mean that that was God's will. For instance, when those pigs went over the cliff, those were Jews ra raising pigs and they knew better. But are we gonna eat pigs because they were raising pigs in the Bible? No. So uh, the Bible tells, we, tells us how we are to understand truth. It is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And so the doctrines that we believe are built upon text by text by text. Two or three witnesses will establish the matter. And I don't think you'll find two or three witnesses with that. Okay, I hope that answers your question, uh, but don't look at those instances as doctrine. Next, we'll go to Techno. Could you please unmute? Good evening. Yes? Um, my question is, when it comes to dresses or skips, I don't know if I heard you correctly, you say that um, we're supposed to cover each and every part of the yes. body, right? Yes. Yeah, so what if, for example, maybe you have a skirt or a dress which is um, long and loose and all that, but maybe it's not reaching all the way up to the toes, uh, maybe let me say halfway the leg, uh, and then maybe you wear tights inside to not expose the other half of the leg. I don't know if you understand, but yeah, uh, is that... Yes, the skirt is too short. You can add some material. You know, when you become a Christian, it's not a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. It's not by chance that the world, I'm sorry, that the Bible refers to it as being born again. I don't know if you understand the significance of that, but truly your values change. We are coming from a worldly point of view to a heavenly point of view. To be instructed in truth, as in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, we should not consider how close we can come to the world or if we can compromise and get away with it. We should study and strain every nerve and fiber of our being to... Uh, comply with what God is asking us. What did he do for us? Do you know that soon Seventh-day Adventists will be brought into worldwide recognition? How will they know us? The servant of the Lord says we should be unified in our dress. According to the prophets, we will be known by the way we dress, by the way we talk, by the love that we have for each other, by the unity of our doctrine. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, this is the very first time there will be unity among God's people. And so if you're willing to obey in all things, and if you read the Bible and you read the spirit of prophecy, God speaks in superlatives when he says he's going to do something. He doesn't say, I'm going, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from most unrighteousness. He says all unrighteousness. And when the father gave Jesus Christ his son, the spirit of prophecy says all heaven was poured out in our behalf. And so my dear sister, my recommendation is that we give all, even as Jesus did. Don't compromise in a jot or in a tittle, but obey the Lord in everything perfectly. And we can do that. 
Thank you for your question. Uh, next person, Ty, Tatita, Tatiana. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, uh, I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, you are. Good. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, my question is based on the scripture that we read. That is Deuteronomy 22, verse five, I think, mm -hmm. which talks about uh, an abomination to wear. Um, uh, clothes that's meant for guys and the, the opposite also being true. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Jesus' time, the gents wore some form of a dress, yes. but having pants on the inside. Yes. I think I missed that part. If it uh, comes to the clothing now, would it mean that uh, dresses too aren't to be worn because that's what the men wore? and also t-shirts are they unisex or they have a specific gender because we first of yes i i have your question i have your question tatiana uh that's a very good question Where and the same t-shirts yes. i i understand let me answer that quickly uh first of all t-shirts are unisex are their cross uh dressing and there you can you can buy the same t-shirts for men this came in not too long ago well you know relatively not too long ago but uh when you consider the dress of robes this is what most people uh want to address and but it's the same principle with jewelry the robes in heaven are fine we're not in a sinful state but dresses all the angels have you ever read of any angels that were women no they're all men and so in our uh world the women dress contact which would lead Israel to join in their debased practices or furthermore they were given specific instructions against dressing in a way that would create the climate for committing sin and then it goes on to repeat that that uh text and then it says because sodomy involves a changing of sex roles which is usually accompanied by a pattern of acting and dressing like the opposite sex, God warned his people not to open any door of temptation on this matter. They were to maintain a clear line of distinction between the dress of men and the dress of women. I hope that answers your question. Okay, next yes, we'll go to... Okay, great. Thank you so much, Tatiana. I love your name. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Chip Pago, could you unmute, unmute please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, good morning. Is it good afternoon? Morning. Yes, that's okay. Uh huh. Um, I wanted to find out, since um, some of us have never embarked on this journey, mm -hmm. and I think it would be wise if we got counsel from those who've already experienced what comes with it. I want to find out if we're asked like, oh, why have you changed the way you dress or why are you dressing in this way? Meaning when we decide to take up what you've taught us today and mm -hmm. implement it in our what are we to say to people who ask us so that we don't seem conceited or judgmental or anything like that? Very good question. Uh, I like that question. First of all, I always said to myself, I wish somebody would ask me, why am I dressing this way? 
But over the 50 years I have been dressing this way, hardly a question. I don't remember anyone asking me. And if they did, you know what I would say? I am a Christian, which means I live by the Bible. I am dressing by the Bible standards. I have in my folder um, a lot of texts. Could you give me that folder in my bag, please? A lot of texts that I um, wrote out years ago, which they are texts on nakedness. And hmm, where is that folder? Um, hmm. Anyway, what happened is we had a food, uh, a food um, business and I had a young lady that worked with me who um, I had, a, that's okay, I can't find it. We, I had a lady that worked with me that refused to put on a long dress. And I said to her, if you don't, and she was living with us, she said, it gets in the way, et cetera. I said, well, I guess you are going to have to find another job because everybody that works here wears long sleeves and a long dress. And I'll be happy to help you find a dress that, you know, you think is more comfortable. Anyway, um, she says, I want to, um, I want to see what you believe from the Bible. I don't want to hear anything from Ellen White. I says, good deal. When would you like to study? She says, uh, tomorrow is fine. I said, meet me at the kitchen table tomorrow morning after breakfast. And what happened was I showed her all the texts on nakedness and I will email this um, sheet. It must be 30 or more texts on nakedness and modesty from the Bible. And I asked her to read the texts. By the time I was finished, I didn't even have half this, the text that I have on the list. But I asked her after she read them, I says, uh, do you have a comment? Because she was so quiet. She says, no, I have nothing to say. And she says, I'm going back to work now. So she was convinced from the Bible. I hope that answers your question, Chapego. You must study for yourself because soon we will have to give an answer for everything that we believe and practice, even dress reform. And we have to give an answer in the Bible. The text that I read to you from the beginning, I don't know if you were here, but in Revelation 1, um, it says this, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. If you study the spirit of prophecy, you'll find it is for our health that God tells us to clothe our arms and our legs. Actually, we are cooler in the summer hot weather. And I know you can testify to this. If we cover our arms and cover our legs, we create an air conditioning um, underneath. And so I hope you are pleased with this answer. We could go more into it, but we have one more question. Thank you so much. It makes thank a lot of sense. You. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, L, please unmute your phone. Um, L, uh, Lemek, Lemek, please unmute. Good, good morning to you, madam. Good morning. Yes, um, my question is based on the understanding that uh, we are coming from different uh, cultural societies. Yes. Yes, these different cultural societies uh, actually have got their own way of dressing. Yes. You might find that uh, in one society, like where I'm coming from, mm -hmm. both men in the traditional ceremony, they put on the same outfit. Yes. Which has kids. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I, have, I, just, I have seen that at general conference. And yes. I question, yes, go right ahead. Yes. yes, I wanted to get your, your views on the same because even Christ himself, as Christians, sometimes we, we try to adopt 
a dressing which is not ours, a Jewish custom, like Christ was, was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, I don't know what to say on that. Okay, I have met the brethren, uh, Fiji Island, I think is where they're from. And uh, they have the skirts on below the knee and the women have the skirts on basically all the way down, uh, which is quite modest for the women, but uh, for the men. Now, let me ask you this. If you were in an area of the world where the women dress like men and the men dress like women, what would you think the women should do? Do you understand the question? No. Kindly repeat. Okay. If you were in a part of the world where the women were required, okay, let, let me just, I, I know what you're going to say. Well, maybe I don't, but let me just say this. First of all, what you, the way the, the men are dressing in the Fiji Island is according to their custom and tradition. It's not according to the Bible. So my recommendation, since culture and custom and tradition means nothing to God, not even the Jewish customs. In fact, the Jews had so many customs and traditions that it prevented them from accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as the son of God. So we are to put aside tradition, no matter how long it's been entrenched in the society, that would cause some, a bit of, uh, how can I say, persecution maybe. It might cause a little bit of uh, almost a gazing stop for a man to put on pants. But it says in Deuteronomy 22, 5, a man shall not put on that which pertains unto a woman. So there you have it. Are you going to obey God? Or are you going to obey man? We have to believe the Bible. That's, you know what that's called? Righteousness by faith. We must believe that when we obey the Bible and we love the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, we don't do these things to get points. We do them because we love Jesus, just like you do things for your wife because you love her. So we do them because we are believing. To stand to be true and not to make an excuse for disobedience. Okay. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Come and be with the Welcome. I think that's the last question. Uh, oh, no. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to read this uh, statement here. It has to do, and it's found in Prophets and Kings, page 188. And I'm going to read. or Seventh-day Adventists, will then yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. 
At that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it all. And by the way, you don't have to understand clearly everything God asks you to do. Just do it by faith. That is the definition of righteousness by faith. Last statement, those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, key phrase there, by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Thank you so much, Zambia University, Sister Grace, and all the brethren there with you. I have enjoyed this time together. May the Lord bless and keep you until we meet again is my prayer. Thank you so much. You can now give us the closing prayer. Okay. okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we kneel before you on this holy Sabbath day, thanking you for this opportunity to share. Lord, I know there have been some strong things said by your Holy Spirit through the word of God and through the spirit of prophecy. But I pray that you will take the truth seekers, those who are not compromisers, those who love you with all their heart, they love you more than they love their own life and you would separate them out and you will continue to teach them and help them to be obedient to every word that you have given us as Seventh-day Adventists. And it's not just dress, it's health, it's recreation. It's how we speak to people and what we think and our attitude. Lord, we want to have the sweetness of Jesus in our life. And I pray that you will touch every student of Zambia University, that those who have heard this message will go out and share it with others by precept and by example. And they will not beat others over the head, but they will be gracious, long suffering and patient. And that your truth will go forth because we know soon it's going to go forth with a loud cry. We cannot do this of ourselves, only your Holy Spirit can, but Lord, we want to be a part of it. So we ask that you will teach us, change us, help us, Lord, in every way possible to come up to the help of the Lord, to be what you would have us to be, and to fulfill the purpose for which you have created us and allowed us to be here at this time in earth's history as a testimony and a witness for your truth and for Jesus. We thank you again for this time and we give you all the praise, the honor and the glory in the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray, amen. Amen. Amen, thank you so much, Sister Green. God bless Green. you. Thank you all too for the opportunity. It was my pleasure. And for those who might want to access your books, how do they, how do they get them? Uh, those who might want to. Okay. Uh, if you could share with them my website and I'll share with them as well. And also I have all of my dress books. I have 10 or 11 of them, including Joe Cruz, Creeping Compromise to mail off to you on Monday. So you will be receiving those. Uh, I think they said within uh, five to seven business days. So be looking for those in the, in the mail, Sister Grace. And you can have my permission to share them with uh, others, the information that is uh, in, in those books. And 
Each one of those books comes from our website or our ministry. And that is Homeward Publishing Ministries dot com homeward like you're on your way home homeward publishing ministries plural dot com got it got it okay god bless you all and thank you again for the opportunity to share thank you so much okay. grace grace you can you can leave the Good Thank morning, you. Sister Blaine, and um, good evening, brothers and sisters. Um, good morning. I praise God for this day, and everything has been said. Sister Gwen, we cannot thank you enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you that the Lord has set you as a beacon of light, and that you have decided to share this light with everyone through your works, what you have written, and the various presentations. May the Lord continue to bless you and your ministry. We pray that um, may this light also reach to others through us. The Lord has various ways in which light um, reaches people. So may the Lord bless you and your ministry. And also to the sisters present here, light is not given to embarrass us, but to enlighten. So let us not feel ashamed. Let us not feel bad. The Lord has a plan for us. And if we only let him, he will change us. Thank you so much, Sister Glenn. I remember we've prayed for this day. We've talked about this day. And finally, the Lord has brought it to pass. We thank him yeah. so much. We glorify him. Yes. Yeah, so please, Sister Glenn, be there for us. Continue being there if we need you again, please. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Let help absolutely. Us. And I hope you recorded this because. Yes. I, oh, good. Wonderful. Send me the link because I want to put it on my website. I Not wish I could have seen more of your faces, though. <laughs> Pretty sure before I finish, I, but thank you so much. We'll share the recordings and um, may the Lord bless you, please. And. Um, Thank you so much again. Thank you also, brothers and sisters, for attending. Okay, thank you too. God bless you. Have a great Sabbath. Oh, is Sabbath over? We're just starting Sabbath here, church. Okay, bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> oh, click that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. You can.